An expansion port allows adding new hardware to a computer without having to change its inner workings. Apart from power and ground, expansion ports usually expose four signal types. The data bus lines, the address lines, the system clock and the read-write control signals of a processor. My minimal CPU system here has an expansion port too. This little thing has about the processing power of a 6502 in the VIC-20 or C64, but it is way simpler in concept. Its performance is really nothing special, nor is it simplicity. It's the combination of the two. It's kind of a SAP1 on steroids and my go-to tool to learn how computers work. Find out more about it in the links in the description. Today let's use the minimal to learn how to interface external hardware to a CPU. I'll build an I.O. card, blink LEDs and read in voltages. Sounds boring? Well, if we succeed, the CPU could in principle control anything. For this episode, special thanks go to my fellow minimalist Nisse from Sweden, aka Slow Corners. He pointed me to the idea of building an expansion port into the minimal. A processor only sees its memory address space. The minimal has 16 bits, that's reaching 64K. Let's hijack a tiny part of it to sneak in our own functionality without the processor noticing. That's called memory mapping. Suppose we want a write access to hex DFF0 to set the output lines of this little 4-bit 74HC173 register here. We'll have to build some logic to determine whether the address lines point to that specific range. I am going to use two dual quad input AND gates 74HC21 for this and some inverters. For now, let's ignore the lower three bits so our final AND goes high if the address range DFF0 to DFF7 is hit. Let's build that. I'll start with all the power and ground connections. Now I go from memory address line M3 to M15. Let's now take a look at the pinout of the Minimal's expansion port. All the memory address lines are on the left side, shown in red, and next to them in the middle, in blue, we have the bus lines. On the right hand side we see the clock and the RAM in and RAM out signals. And there's this INH or inhibit signal. We'll come back to that later and start with connecting the memory lines. This time I'll work my way down from M15 to M3. Let us now take a look at the pinout of the output register. We have the Q outputs in red with their active low output enables OE. Let's tie them low. In blue we have four data inputs with their input enables E1 and 2. Since they are again active low, we need to invert our memory range signal and then connect it to E1. I am going to wire the inverted RAM in or write enable control signal of the processor to E2. Finally, I'll connect the system clock to CL and the lower four data bus lines to D0 to D3. Now the register samples the bus only if both enable signals are low. And I'll hook up some LEDs to the register's output lines. Let's power up the CPU and give it a go. We can write values to hex DFF0 using the boot monitor commands. And there you have it. We can blink LEDs. How fancy is that? Bye bye Arduino Hello Minimal.
Of course, this feature is fully programmable. A Knight Rider effect seems to be the gold standard when it comes to blinking LEDs. Now let us see if we can implement input functionality too. I'll use another 74HC173 register and hook up this RAM out control signal and our address range indicator, but this time to the output enable pins. I'll tie both input enables low so that they are permanently sampling. The register's output lines simply connect to the system bus. I tie the register inputs low via 10k pull down resistors. In the on position, the switch forces them high. During a read from hex DFF0, the system RAM as well as our register will put their value onto the bus, resulting in a bus conflict. I forgot to deactivate the CPU's memory. That's the purpose of this inhibit input on the expansion port. Since it is again active low, we can simply hook it up to our memory range signal to render the CPU memory inactive when we don't need it. Let us pause here for a moment and see how that actually works inside the minimal. Jumping into the schematic of the memory module, we see the flash memory and the RAM. The address line M15 decides whether the chip enable of the one or the other is active. But in the middle you see these two NAND gates connected to the inhibit line. As long as inhibit is tied high, they don't have any influence. However, if inhibit is pulled low by our extension card, neither RAM nor flash will be able to get active and cause bus conflicts. Instructions like LDA will read the value from our register directly into the accumulator of the CPU. Pretty neat, isn't it? I have written a little program here that continuously reads the input lines and prints out the value in hex format. As you can see, we can play around with our DIP switch and our CPU detects it. Ok, our general purpose IO card is working now. Of course, using these long jumper wires to connect it to the expansion port is a bit cumbersome. I recommend using Arduino style pin sockets on a PCB instead. I've ordered these long pin versions so I can stack multiple expansion PCBs on top of each other. But more on that in the next video. Let me know in the comments what expansion card you want to see next. I find timers or counters interesting. Maybe a PS2 interface or a VGA card for the minimal or even an SD card reader. And maybe I will connect my good old data set to it, right? <laughs> Take care. Bye.